Well, we're going to get started. The hearing will come to order. Welcome to everyone. I'd like to welcome General Services Administration, Administrator Denise Roth to the hearing today. Last year you were here after just a month on the job. Now you've been on the job for over a year, so we're happy to welcome you back. Now, everybody knows this is a leap year, right? And so today is leap day. And with that in mind, I think we should jump right in. I wanted to see if Mr. Serrano was paying attention. No. The budget request today is for $10.18 billion for the Federal Building Fund, which is less than 1% below enacted. So that's less than last year, but while your request appears to be flat, it spends $371 million more in rental income from agencies than it did last year. So I caution the GSA from growing overzealous in its requests. In the 2016 omnibus, GSA received an unprecedented 215% increase for construction and acquisition for numerous construction projects. And this was a significant increase, but this level of spending should not be viewed as the new norm. Therefore, I look forward to discussing GSA's request for new construction in fiscal year 2017. This brings me to the administration's request for the FBI headquarters consolidation. Last year's hearing, we discussed GSA's proposal to exchange the FBI's current headquarters at the Hoover Building for a new 2.1 million square foot facility in the greater Washington area. It was my understanding when GSA started to pursue such a complicated property exchange of unprecedented size that GSA was convinced that the value of the Hoover Building would be more than enough to pay for a new FBI headquarters. However, as we all know, the value of anything is whatever the market will bear, and the market has spoken uh, so far, and the value of the Hoover, Hoover Building is $1.8 billion less than what GSA expected. So today, in addition to the $390 million provided in the omnibus, the administration is asking the subcommittee for $759 million and another $646 million from the Commerce Justice Science Subcommittee. So that concerns me a little bit about the size of this request, and I still wonder whether GSA has the expertise to e execute such a complicated transaction. So we'll have a frank discussion about that today. To date, the, S F the Congress has appropriated $1.6 billion in full consolidation or full consolidation of the Department of Homeland Security headquarters at St. Elizabeth. That request includes another $267 million for 2017. As GSA moves forward with its enhanced plan for St. Elizabeth, I hope to hear more about the GSA's continued effort with the DHS to reduce construction costs and increase project efficiency. The President's budget also seeks to establish a $3.1 billion information technology modernization fund within GSA to replace legacy IT systems all across the government. Now, as the subcommittee that oversees the Office of Personnel and Management, we know as well as anyone about the numerous cybersecurity and operational risks that using an old system poses. We have been continually supportive of funding IT upgrades as part of the agency's annual budget request. However, uh, I question the proposed $3 billion in mandatory funding and $100 million in discretionary funding. For what exactly, uh, we don't know because the administration has not formally transmitted legislative language to the Congress. What I do know is that agencies should be requesting funding for, to refresh their IT systems on a regular basis as part of their regular budget request. The IRS is a good example of an agency that chooses to spend less and less on rudimentary IT and is experiencing more and more hiccups. So now in the fiscal year 2016 omnibus, the committee provided GSA with construction funding to address longstanding needs and dire conditions at federal courthouses all around the country. The funding provided is important to maintain an open, accessible, and well-functioning judicial system. Today, I hope to learn more about how GSA will work with the judiciary branch to ensure the court's needs are best met while also safeguarding the investment of the American taxpayer. 
And finally, I want to emphasize this committee's commitment to shrinking the federal footprint through reductions in GSA's inventory of leased and owned space. Over the past several years, this committee has provided significant funding for GSA consolidation activities, and I hope to hear today how GSA is using those resources to reduce space, lower rental costs, serve your customers, and ultimately save the taxpayers' dollars. Once again, welcome, Administrator Roth. Appreciate your service. Look forward to your testimony. But first, let me turn to the ranking member, Mr. Serrano, for any opening remarks he might make. Thank you, and a happy 29th day of the month to you. So somebody who was born today celebrates yesterday or tomorrow? Don't ask me. Okay. But I do know that it takes 365.2526 days to go around the sun. Mr. Yoder, you should have warned me not to ask. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to join you in welcoming the Administrator of the General Services Administration before our subcommittee. You were confirmed by the Senate last year after our hearing with you, so I really want to congratulate you on transitioning to this role more permanently. GSA plays a critical role in making sure our government is running efficiently and effectively that it is open and transparent to our citizens and that our federal agencies have the resources they need in order to succeed. You combine a variety of roles in one agency, landlord, project manager, procurement specialist, real estate agent, IT specialist, the list goes on and on and on. Although you don't see the GSA's name mentioned as much in the media and the press, this variety of roles shows just how critical you are to our government operate, how our government operates. And I think this subcommittee recognizes that as well. Last year, this subcommittee, this uh, committee included significant new funds for the construction of new federal buildings, including several courthouses. I'm interested to know how these projects are moving forward and whether the large increase has been a problem in terms of ensuring appropriate personnel to oversee project management. <clears throat> Your budget request this year is slightly smaller, but really only in comparison to last year's final numbers. Your budget includes funding for several construction projects, as well as numerous important repairs and alterations which will help reduce the federal backlog in both areas. You also include funding for several new initiatives, two of which I imagine we will spend some time discussing today. One project that GSA has completely changed positions on is the FBI headquarters. Last year, this subcommittee was told that the General Services Administration planned to use their exchange power to raise funds to purchase a new FBI campus in either Maryland or Virginia. We were specifically told at last year's hearing that no appropriated funds would be needed for this project, and that this committee had no role to play. Well, something has clearly changed. Since your budget request this year includes a request for $759 million in appropriated funding for the construction of a new FBI building, combined with the FBI's request of $646 million for the same project, we are facing the exact problem that Chairman Crenshaw and I mentioned last year, the expectation that the Appropriations Committee is going to clean up the mess when the Exchange Authority doesn't raise the funds that are necessary for this project. The building hasn't even been sold yet, and this request already tells us that whatever the proceeds are, they won't be near enough. On top of that, it has not been made clear to this subcommittee what the scope of this project is and whether the funds requested this year are sufficiently sufficient to fully construct the project. It is also somewhat troubling to receive this request when we appear to be years away from potentially breaking ground unless there is an imminent announcement that we are unaware of. I expect we will have a lot of discussion about this issue today. A new initiative requested this year is the IT Modernization Fund. I fully support efforts to modernize our government IT uh, systems, but this request has not yet been authorized, leaving us with requests money the GSA cannot do anything with if we actually appropriate. I would be very open to conversations about how 
to make our IT procurement system more nimble and responsive to changing technologies, but I'm not sure if this particular request is the way to do it. That said, by and large, I support the numerous efforts GSA is making to ensure the federal agencies are accountable and effective organizations. I look forward to discussing these in more details with you today, and this should be a very interesting uh, hearing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Now I'd like to recognize Administrator Roth for your statement. If you could keep it in the neighborhood of five minutes, uh, your full statement will be inserted into the record. So the floor is yours. Pardon me, should I start over? Good afternoon, Chairman Crenshaw, Ranking Member Serrano, and members of the committee. Thank you for inviting me to today's hearing on the President's fiscal year 2017 budget request for the General Services Administration. First, I would like to thank the committee for the robust funding provided to the General Services Administration in the FY16 Appropriations Bill. We will continue to ensure that GSA utilizes these funds wisely and efficiently as befitting the trust you have placed in our agency. Overall, the President's fiscal year 2017 budget builds on last year's progress of prioritizing agency real estate consolidations and infrastructure investments to maximize space utilization, improve security, expand trade, and spur economic development within communities across the nation. In addition, this budget request seeks to enhance the cybersecurity and efficiency of the federal government's IT infrastructure by modernizing IT legacy systems. Within the Federal Buildings Fund, I would like to highlight three important projects that will strengthen our national security infrastructure and benefit the American taxpayer. First, GSA seeks $759 million to support the construction of a new headquarters facility for the FBI. This new facility will consolidate FBI employees from 13 leased locations across the nas national capital region within a new modern and secure facility. GSA's FY17 budget request in conjunction with the FBI's $646 million request will allow GSA to award a contract for design and construction of a new FBI headquarters by the end of this calendar year. Second, GSA is requesting $267 million to continue executing the enhanced plan for the consolidated DHS headquarters, which will bring FEMA to the St. Elizabeth's West Campus completing nearly 80% of this project. The enhanced plan for St. Elizabeth's, when completed, will reduce the federal footprint by nearly 10 million square feet and save more than $4 billion through avoided lease costs. Third, GSA is requesting $248 million for the second and final phase of the Calexico Westland Port of Entry Modernization, which will improve the security of our nation's borders, as well as promote expanded commerce and trade and support local economic development. All of these investments have a significant impact on the communities in which these projects are located. GSA recognizes its role as an economic catalyst in these communities and works with stakeholders to align investments with local community planning and economic development efforts. We also must use the Federal Buildings Fund to support the evolving missions of our partner agencies and combat the growing costs of real estate. Through consolidation and innovative space solutions, we have reduced the lease inventory by more than 3 million square feet, rentable square feet, since 2012 with a projected reduction of 3 million additional rentable square feet by the end of FY 2017. GSA has also partnered with agencies to accelerate the disposal of excess property. In, in FY 2015, we helped agencies dispose of 172 properties, generating $56 million in proceeds. Beyond our bricks and mortar infrastructure is our information technology infrastructure on which the government and the global economy depends. Reliable IT is vital to all of the services the government provides. However, many federal agencies are unable to effectively modernize IT infrastructure and mission critical systems due to large upfront capital investment needs and the increasing share of costs that maintaining these older systems occupy in technology budgets. To address these issues, the budget includes a request to establish a $3.1 billion information technology modernization fund 
which would be used to retire and modernize leg legacy information technology systems to improve cybersecurity and the delivery of services as well as reduce costs. In closing, GSA has made significant progress in fulfilling our mission to deliver the best value in real estate acquisition and technology services to government and the American people. The President's FY 2017 request will enable us to move forward along this trajectory of providing more efficient and effective services at a lower cost so that agencies can focus on their crucial mission. Thank you for this opportunity to be with you today, and I look forward to answering your questions. Well, thank you very much. And, and let me start the questions. I, I think you probably figured we, we would ask some questions about the FBI. Uh, Mr. Serrano mentioned that uh, in his opening statement, as did I, that when we met last year, uh, we had a, a pretty lengthy discussion about the whole concept of this exchange swap. Um, and, a, and a couple of questions. I guess to start with, what, what, what were you thinking last year was going to be the value uh, of the Hoover Building? Did you, did, did you have any idea what that might be, and did you have any idea of what it might cost to build 2.1 million square feet? Sir, we did have uh, ideas that we have been working from. Um, we've been avoiding talking about specific costs related to both the uh, value of Hoover as well as the project overall, um, primarily because we're in an active procurement process currently. How did, how did, how did you find out that, that the Hoover building is worth $1.8 billion less than you thought it might be? Let me say, and just in stepping back, the project itself and what we had before both this committee as well as the other committee from FBI is really a reflection of where the project is uh, in terms of trying to achieve the full consolidation as well as FBI's requirement. And I would say that over the past year, we've gotten a, a better understanding as a project is coming into its maturity of what the costs uh, reflect. And so we believe with the funding both we've received from this committee and FY16, as well as the request that's pending, um, as well as with the, uh, the any cost that we receive from its value would be uh, reflective of what's needed for the project. Well, well last year when we talked, it, there was indication that I think $291 million was appropriated part of the omnibus. Was that, was, was it 391 or 291? I can't remember. But anyway, the, 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 I think we were told that, that that would be it from the appropriation standpoint. That would get things started, whatever. Now, there's like, if you add up those two, it's about a billion four. So I guess you can understand why we're a little surprised, can't, can't you? Absolutely. And uh, this has been an evolving project. And, and the, the part that I would point back to in particular is really what we're going to learn both from how the market values this project, but as well as the further understanding of the requirements of the project. Um, we received clear indication that full consolidation for this project was supported um, in something that we needed to uh, ensure was a priority as we brought this project to bear. And the requests are really reflective of that. Well, how, how confident are you that the evaluation that has now, I guess, been put on the Hoover Building, how confident are you that, that that's correct? We have worked very closely with uh, FBI in terms of just, and this is really going to the requirements overall, but in terms of the valuation itself, um, we are really looking forward to what the uh, market uh, responds to. And, and we have the uh, responses due back from the developers by this summer. Uh, that's really going to be the first indication of how they're valuing the project. And we are going to evaluate. Well, I mean, how do you know today or I, that it's like $1.8 billion less than you thought? Really, because of the requirements. As we start to build out what the cost of the requirements are and, and the way that we've worked very closely with FBI over the past year, that really has given us a sense, as well as... Uh, so, I mean, do you, do you have the site the, like, do you have an appraisal of the, of the Hoover building? We have... Um, the appraisal we have on record is actually an older appraisal. We will likely do appraisals as we go through the process this year. Um, but really what we're looking for, what we've stood up is really compared between where the requirements are today from FBI and having more closely with them, what we know about the sites themselves and having gotten through the environmental evaluation of them, um, and then what we will see in June as we get those uh, responses back from the developers. That's really what we're lining up. And so is going to were you not sure, like, like, I guess there are two sides of the equation. If you're going to do 
a swap or an exchange, you got to say, what's, what's the Hoover building worth, right? Yes. And then how much is it going to cost to build this new 2.1 million square feet? So it sounds like you didn't have a very good idea of, of what that was if, if you missed it by almost $2 billion, right? I believe that um, what the effort was really about an exchange to offset any request for appropriations. I mean, ultimately, to use the tool of the exchange and be able to get the uh, a full project uh, would have meant that we didn't have to have an appropriations request. I think really with having a full consolidation on the table as well as uh, the requirements as we understand them to really meet the mission of FBI is reflective of the change that you're seeing. Well, like, did you ever think about just selling the Hoover building? Sure. And, and, and one of the things that we know is with the exchange, we can assure that uh, that the pre proceeds from that project go into the new Hoover location. But I mean, you're not going you're not, you're to do an exchange, right? Yes. I mean, did you, you think about the fact that if, if you're going to exchange the building, then the developer is going to have some carrying costs while he builds the building, mm -hmm. which, which might, did you, did you think about whether you should just sell the building, put the money in the bank, then go ask somebody to build a new one and use part of the proceeds for that from, from what you, I mean, how did you decide it was better to do a swap or an exchange than to just sell the building and then hire somebody to build your new space? And, and oftentimes we have sold the properties and used uh, then our budget requests to go for it with a new project. Ultimately, there was a couple of aspects of this uh, uh, proposal that are different and unique. Uh, one of them is the fact that we're talking about the Hoover, which is on Pennsylvania Avenue, a rare place to get an opportunity to develop. I think that that was part of bringing developers to the table and being interested in this project. Um, ultimately, if we were to do a typical disposal, um, we would have to come back and ask for a larger uh, appropriations request, certainly, as well as then go through the process of a new uh, building overall. Um, and really having the exchange as a part of this can offset what we have to ask this committee for. Is, is this the biggest exchange you've ever done? This would be the largest. Have you ever done, has GSA ever done any other exchanges? We have done other exchanges of varying scales. Um, I think that the exchanges that we've been talking about in the recent past are the largest that we have seen in some time. You got any idea how many exchanges you've done in the last 10 years? Uh, in terms of this scale, we have not done an exchange of this scale. So are you still comfortable? Last year, we, 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 we kind of questioned whether or not, and this is pretty complicated, and is this something that you have in-house capabilities to do, or is this something you're contracting with some outside folks? How are you handling this? Sure. As a part of all of our construction projects, we will definitely bring in expertise to help with various aspects, anything from uh, evaluating the requests, uh, the proposals themselves, to doing traffic studies. Did you, did like, for instance, last year, had you brought anybody in to kind of give you an idea of what, you know, what numbers we might be talking about? Did, because, again, we missed it by at least $2 billion. For instance, and along that line, I mean, how do we know you ask for another billion four? How do you know what this, this new $2.1 million of office space is going to cost? I mean, do you, do you know that yet? I mean, where, does, where those numbers come from and why is half of it from GSA and half of it from FBI? What, what we do know is uh, having worked with FBI much closely, very closely over the past year, having a good sense of the requirements, that's giving us a sense of what the costs are, just really what, how they're programming the space and how they plan to utilize it. And this really has been a very, very much a shared effort between us and FBI, and we've worked intensely over the past year. And it's part of the reason you're seeing the requests come from both, because this isn't a shared effort, as well as just the number itself, as you point out, um, would be large uh, overall in definitely wanted, didn't want to overburden any either budget request. Um, but at the end of the day, what's really going to tell us what we have for the project are those various pieces. What the requirements are is really setting the cost, ensuring that we're achieving a full consolidation as a part of this request, and then trying to, um, both with the appropriations and the 16 funding and the uh, the offset of the value of Hoover, really bringing the project to bear. Sure, do you, I mean, do you have, where do you get the 1.4 billion for the appropriation request this year? A part of it is set by the requirements in the, of the full consolidation. And, and, and who looked at that and decided that it was going to cost $1.4 billion? We do use a team of experts to support our efforts. At so you've got that laid out. You, is, it, is the 2.1 million square feet, is that 
Is that right? Yes. That, yes. And so now somebody said that's going to cost a little bit more than we might have thought because either you missed it on the that side or you missed it on the on the value of, of the hood. I mean, I hope you'll appreciate our concern is when when you come in and say, look, if we had three hundred million dollars, we got a very viable piece of property downtown. We can exchange it. Somebody will build us a building and that's going to be great. And then you still ask you what what's the what's the value and, and nobody seems to know yet other than the new estimate is we missed it by 1.8 billion. It's it's it, it's it's going to be 1.8 billion less than we thought or somehow the office space is going to cost more. I, I think as stewards of the taxpayers dollars we we got to have a better handle uh, from you on on where the money is going to go. So that's, I mean, I'm, other members might have questions as well, but I, 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 I did want to bring that up because I think that's something that we're going to have to really work through. Sure, Mr. Chairman, and it's not that we don't know what the project scope is. It really is a reflection of not wanting to overburden our requests. I mean, ultimately, if we had a project for full funding, full consolidation as we do now, um, it, it will have a large burden on our other projects, as this will, um, it, but it's still a high priority project. The idea was for the exchange to offset the cost overall and offset what we would have to request and how we were actually staging the project. Um, but we're talking in terms of where we are today, full consolidation and requirements very much reflective of where FBI and where this project is today. Well, the, and the last question, it just, it just, that was your idea. It was a great idea, but it wasn't based, doesn't sound like it's based on reality, unless we can find out more about where these appraisals are and all those kind of things. So I, I think we're, we're concerned about that. Mr. Serrano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> you know, uh, Administrator, some uh, some pundits would say that it's very easy to confuse members of Congress. Well, this may be an example of one where we are innocent of being easily confused. It's just very confusing. We're trying to get to the bottom of it. Based on your budget request, it seems that in addition to the $1.5 billion in appropriations, GSA will still need to give the Hoover building to the developer. In last year's hearing, you would not tell the committee, how much the Hoover building was appraised for, but there is no way for us to analyze your appropriation needs without knowing what you and the developer are assuming the Hoover building is worth. Can we get the current appraised amount today? The current appraised amount is actually um, from an old appraisal. As a part of this process, we will do an appraisal of the project, but in terms of uh, both the estimates and costs that are going, or the estimates that are going into the project, it is much better situation for the government to be in to wait for uh, responses from the developers um, it, it, before we are talking about any of the numbers and getting through awards. I mean, ultimately, we have three developers that are competing. They're running estimates on the various sites as well as the overall project, as well as the value of it will give us on Hoover. And to talk about those numbers as a part in an open setting um, really will undermine our efforts. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Except for the military, an open setting is a, uh, a, a public hearing, and we usually like to get the information, but I'm, I'm not going to press you on that. Could you at least give an idea of the appraisal value to our staffs at the minimum? I mean, they're sworn to secrecy. We'll definitely follow up with the staff. So, and, and again, it really is just the integrity of the procurement process that um, uh, that I'm focused on. I mean, we were right in the middle of the procurement and really just want to make sure we get the best uh, deal out of it that we can. I understand that, but, you know, um, the chairman has to respond to people, uh, to members, who for their own reasons and for their beliefs don't believe in spending certain amounts of money. I, on the other hand, want to be helpful in investing in the future, as they are too. So you don't help us by telling us, I can't tell you that in public, and I'm, I'm trying to be helpful here by saying, could you at least tell us, tell us in private so that we have an idea what we're dealing with, because that's what we do as appropriators. We appropriate, but we're not gonna appropriate in the dark. And then no party's gonna do that, and it doesn't matter 
who the administration is, we're just not going to appropriate in the dark. We need to ensure that we are getting the best price for the government for the Hoover Building administrator. Is there a chance that the building is being undervalued as part of this exchange and would bring in a higher price if sold on its own? I think um, what's unique about this exchange in, in this process uh, overall um, and part of what's brought uh, the interest to the table is the fact that Hoover itself is on Pennsylvania Avenue. And, and you know, it's America's Main Street. And ultimately, to be able to uh, have access uh, to, that, uh, to that property, I think is part of what makes the, pro the package overall attractive. Um, so taking the exchange out would have an effect, I think, on the project overall. Well, there's, there's one part I totally don't understand, and it might be that I didn't pay attention to what the uh, chairman was asking. Why is the developer getting the building? You know, I come from a city where developers are always getting, uh, people think the developers are getting more than they should. Why is the developer getting the building? What is the developer, refresh us again, why is the developer giving us in return for getting the building? Well, as a part of utilizing the exchange tool, we are actually giving the, the uh, building itself, the Hoover building, uh, in exchange for a new uh, building that will service as the headquarters for FBI. All right, and um, are the FBI and Department of Homeland Security headquarters being treated the same? Specifically, I want to know what the GSA request is going to be used for versus the agency's request. My understanding is that GSA provided a warm lid shell and DHS appropriation was used for the interior. Is that the same with the FBI's headquarters? It is the same. The requests that are before you and, and FBI's request is, t is for construction. Okay. Um, I'm sure Mr. Yoder has some questions. I did learn something, Mr. Chairman. I thought America's Main Street was River Avenue where Yankee Stadium is located, but I guess not. Michigan and Chicago? I should have stopped when I was there. Okay. You, you, I'll turn to Mr. Yoder now. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I actually do represent the heartland, which is really the main street of the whole country, <laughs> so you're welcome to come anytime. Uh, Administrator, welcome to the committee. Uh, appreciate your testimony today. Uh, I wanted to ask you about your understanding of the GSA's role at the Bannister Federal Complex in Kansas City, which is a former a, a facility that's closed, and I, I want to know a little bit about where it's going, but I first want to talk about where it's been. Uh, if you are aware, the Bannister Federal Complex in Kansas City uh, made a variety of things. They made in airplane engines during World War II, but later they shifted and began making components for nuclear weapons. Uh, and after you know, many folks dedicated their career there, it became a, they became aware that they were exposed to significant amounts of radioactive material. There's been, been some $55 million actually paid out to these workers at a former uh, GSA facility. Um, and But the vast majority are frustrated and they haven't been paid. And some live in my district, some live in Emanuel Cleaver's district where the facility is located in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, and the types of uh, claims that have been uncompensated are pretty significant. You have hundreds of people with skin cancer, uh, beryllium sensitivity, lung cancer, prostate cancer, chronic beryllium disease, chronic obstructive airway, female breast cancer, asthma, kidney cancer, bladder cancer, uh, and the, the list goes on and on and on. And so I know this is uh, a, a real tragedy that's occurred here. And um, these constituents are coming to me asking why their claims haven't been paid, only a fraction have been paid. And so I guess I'd first like to know, um, can you provide me any information about what the GSA's role uh, was in that situation uh, in terms of informing them of what they might be exposed to? And what are the general policies on that today? Uh, for workers that may be being exposed to uh, materials that could affect their health. Yes, Congressman, thank you for the question. Uh, this has obviously been an ongoing item for the agency and one that uh, we will continue to address as, as uh, concerns are raised. Um, my understanding, and I've, I've spent just a little bit of time with this item, um, is that we ha did have uh, situations in which there were individuals who were concerned about illnesses related to the environmental health of the, loca of the location. Um, at this point, uh, we have not made, or GSA has not found that there was a connection between the environmental 
uh, health of the footprint that is GSA. Obviously, there was another uh, other activity on this site overall, um, but we continue to be open and listening to any requests that are brought forward. Um, but at this stage, we don't have any that have um, that we have identified where there was an illness, and as a relation of the illness that it was connected to the environmental health of the footprint managed by GSA. So you're saying that the uh, that the facilities weren't managed by the GSA. In, in the foot, no, the footprint uh, that is the part of GSA's footprint. There is another agency. Um, so what what was the portion that the GSA was responsible for? And I can't, I can't, uh, I don't know the property well enough as I sit here to talk about specifics of the separation of the site itself, but there is a portion of the envelope that is GSA and a portion that's managed by another agency. And to your knowledge, there's no overlap in terms of individuals that would be exposed to this radioactive material that would be GSA employees or GSA controlled space? Not to my knowledge as I sit here, but we will definitely work with your staff and work very closely with any uh, concerns that have been raised to your attention as well. I would like to deal with those. Um, yeah, I mean, I just have hundreds of constituents in my district that feel like their claims aren't being heard. Uh, they've, uh, many of them suffering from devastating cancers. 554 people are deceased, uh, and um, their, some of their claims have been denied. Um, the approval rate for cases involving former workers at the plant is particularly low at just 23%, less than half the national average. So um, it's a problem that, uh, you know, our, my heart breaks for these folks, and I want to make sure the government's doing them justice and doing them right. So I just like your help to the extent that GSA can be involved in that to advocate for these workers to ensure that uh, uh, they were uh, are being properly compensated. And I guess my follow-up is um, two follow-ups. One, what are the measures the GSA is going to take going forward to ensure that these types of things don't occur in the future for properties the GSA manages? You know, what are safety measures that you yourself uh, believe are in place? And then there's a timeline for cleanup uh, of the facility for disposal, uh, for the site for disposal and cleanup. Can you clarify your agency's involvement in that uh, process? Sure, and, and, and just to be clear, there were uh, invest items that needed to be investigated by GSA, and we have done so, and we will continue to uh, investigate any items that are brought to our attention. Um, there has uh, There's a number of things happening at that site uh, because of the size of the footprint. Uh, we actually are, are expanding some presence there um, on certain parts of the site, and it would probably be worthwhile for us to come back to the committee staff and talk through the aspects of the site. Um, but overall, uh, we take the environmental concerns of our properties very seriously. Um, obviously, we have a number of properties that we manage, uh, and really the environmental health of the employees that work there and the safety of those employees is something that is of high concern to us. So we will continue to, and we do with, with each of our sites, um, watch and monitor closely, um, try to ensure that we have an understanding of any vulnerabilities are there and follow up as appropriately. But I, we will definitely ensure that whatever steps are um, are necessary here to respond to your constituents specifically in the project overall that we continue to do that. I appreciate that. Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back, but I'll just say that you know, the examples like these, I think, have to remind us that we have to be vigilant in making sure that federal workers who work at GSA facilities or other facilities that are <laughs> exposed to uh, harmful materials, that um, we make sure, do everything we can to make sure that doesn't happen and make sure that they're aware of it. Uh, protect them, and then when things do go wrong and we do have health outcomes, that we do everything to compensate them and make it right. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I strongly agree with Mr. Yoder's remarks. Uh, Ms. Roth, I understand your concern about sharing the appraisal numbers with the 17 people watching on C-SPAN right now. <laughs> but let's talk about something perhaps that we do want the public to know about. Um, the federal real property profile. Um, I saw that GAO had found the issues with the database and questions of reliability. Now I understand huge database and conflicting information coming from different sources, but uh, it also raised questions about the property reductions and the associated cost savings. Um, being overstated as a result of those uh, inaccuracies. Can you talk about that, just how serious that problem is and what you're trying to do to overcome? Sure, and, uh, and just to separate the two in particular, the real property database, as you point out, Congressman, is uh, 
uh, it does have a lot of sources that it pulls from. And there are steps that we've taken to work with our federal partners in, ter in terms of improving the integrity and quality of that data um, to the extent of ensuring that very senior level <coughs> individuals in those agencies are having are seeing the data as it's being submitted, as well as doing some mandatory drop downs, as well as smart assessments of uh, information that is uh, entered into the database from year to year. Uh, this is something we're rolling out this year. If, if they um, a uh, square footage, for example, in a property is drastically different from one year to the next, the database would actually flag the agency to deal with those discrepancies. When it comes to disposal itself, however, uh, we have more accuracy around the actual activity that's occurring. So when we are actually going through a disposal process with an agency, we are uh, spending more time hands-on with that property itself and so can confirm uh, the disposal activity and what we're actually disposing and the savings therein. But the data available in the Federal Real Property Profile is not available to the public not available online. Uh, I guess there's summary reports, which are kind of Excel spreadsheets. You know, several of us have been trying to address these issues of excess property. It's hard to know what we have. I'm not sure anybody in the government can put a summation on all this and uh, what, their, what their value is. Uh, I think we need to get that in order and begin to talk about how to make it more available to the public. Yes, sir, and wholeheartedly agree. Um, we have been working with G at least the properties that are under GSA's management uh, to enhance how we're making that data sets available, even to the extent that uh, we have a now a website that shows a map where you can sort of hover over the locations and get a pretty good snapshot of data as well as click into it and get more information. Uh, we want to be a resource for federal agencies as they uh, work to make uh, data more available um, and have formats and platforms that they can pull from pretty quickly. But we'll continue to work with OMB and the other agencies on that effort. Let me ask you to touch on one more thing quickly. Um, GSA has some responsibility or helps to a degree helping federal workers gain access to child care facilities, uh, especially here in D.C. We are hearing the availability, especially on the Hill, is long waiting line list for such things, an exorbitant cost of this sort of thing, to the point we actually hear people making career decisions and family decisions based on the fact that there is no affordable child care. Your thoughts on this? Well, I, I will be happy to follow up with your office regarding what role we play and if there's anything we can do to support, even to the extent of information. As a mother of a young child myself, I mean, the idea of not having um, child care that is affordable or easy and accessible is, I can understand, very problematic. So I, we will do everything we can to support that effort. In the meantime, have you heard at all from staff, workers, other people in GSA just about what the list are, the cost, and so forth here, especially in the Hill from my own staff, for example? I, I can't say that I have directly, but I will definitely follow up. Oh, I appreciate up. that. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll yield back. Thank you. Thank you. I, I want to ask you about the, the, the $3.1 billion uh, fund for the IT. But, but let me just finish up with the FBI. Just, just so you'll understand, we're, 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 we're pretty much as Mr. Serrano said, in the dark, if, if, if you come in and say, we got a building that's worth X dollars and we're going to build a new building that's worth X dollars, that, that is a, sounds like a fair trade. But I don't know, somehow we got to know where you got the numbers and where you get the number to say we missed it by $1.8 billion. Because if you had a, if you say it cost $2 billion to build a new building, but we got a building that's worth $2 billion, then that, that works, right? Yes. But but if somehow there's an almost two billion dollar discrepancy, that means either a that that the building you had wasn't worth what you thought it was, or the building you're going to build, you can't build what you thought you could build. And and that's I mean, we got to know that, but particularly when you walk in and say we need another 1.8 billion to finish our project, but we don't have any other numbers. So somehow we got to work through that. That you want you to tell all the three developers what the numbers are, but everybody's got an idea of how much it costs to build a building, and everybody has an idea how much a building's worth. So as soon as we can get that, uh, it'll make a whole lot easier for us. 
And, and I appreciate it, Mr. Chairman, and we want to work very closely and we'll continue to work very closely with the committee. Obviously, we are asking uh, for your support and, and want you to feel confident about this effort. Uh, so we'll definitely uh, look forward to continue to follow up with you and have discussions. Um, obviously, the, the, this is a different project with a different scope at this stage in, in terms of a full consolidation and understanding the requirements, and that's really having the impact. But absolutely, sir, I understand the position the committee's in. Well, thank you. Now, the $3.1 billion, uh, you got $3 billion in, in mandatory and $100 million in discretionary. How's that, how, where where'd that idea come from? Uh, do the agencies request IT upgrades every year? Uh, $3 billion is a lot of money all of a sudden. How does that, how's that work and why is that mandatory versus discretionary? Well, let me say the, this uh, effort overall, the IT modernization fund really is a, it grew out of the Cybersecurity and Actual Action Plan that the President presented. Um, you're aware last year we had the Cyber Sprint um, and out of that discussion and out of that evaluation, it was clear that part of the major vulnerability or major need for federal agencies was in the area of IT legacy and supporting the replacement of IT legacy. Um, and, and so as such, the idea of this modernization fund um, specifically is to support that effort. As agencies look to replace legacy systems, the highest cost is really in that initial upfront cost. Uh, the idea is for this fund to be a revolving uh, self-sustaining fund that agencies can apply to uh, to pay back over five year period uh, the cost of the uh, of the uh, investment overall um, but it also has the benefit of helping us see across government uh, sometimes agencies are trying to deal with a legacy issue in a silo in terms of its agency itself when actually the solution actually may be something that either multiple agencies can utilize or uh, multiple agencies have already solved for. Um, so we are seeing it both from, from both perspectives, both the, um, the business enterprise perspective of how do we be rationalized and have smart investments around our IT that can support everyone, um, as well as helping to seed and support what agencies are fo faced with on a regular basis. Um, in, in the reflection in the uh, request will reflect that. And, and as you pointed out earlier, um, the legislation revolving this request um, should be to uh, you and your other members uh, in the next couple of weeks, next few weeks. Because there'll be some authorizing language, I, I assume. Is it going to, you're going to ha have to hire some more staff to, to administer this fund? Yes, there would be additional staff. It would be, have a programming office, and the staff and the focus of the office would be really to evaluate uh, the investments themselves um, to give. Is that all included in the three point one billion? Yes. You know, the OMB oversees all the computers of everybody in the federal government. I can't remember what the number. It's billions of dollars we spend on computers all across the federal government, and we had Mr. Donovan say that if they coordinated all the. I guess buying of computer equipment, they, they might be able to save as much as 50%. So uh, is that something you've talked to OMB about, about how all this would work? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is actually an effort we were working very closely with OMB. Uh, this is a, a outgrowth of the federal CIO, um, obviously a part of the senior team at OMB. So this is very much in conjunction with them. GSA's role is really, um, obviously, as an administrative arm, it makes sense for this to be uh, coordinated through GSA. Uh, but we have worked very closely with other agencies on their IT needs. In how general. does it? I don't know how. How do you? How do you decide? We want to. We want 100 million from discretionary, but. We we want $3 billion out of mandatory. It really goes hand in hand. Um, and I mean, how do you decide we want this $3 billion? We can, you know, you, you're not really appropriating that, so you can say, well, we only asked for $100 million, but somewhere the th $3 billion, how did you decide to, to put that as a part of mandatory spending? It was the preference of, uh, and we worked closely with OMB in terms of how that request came through. Uh, ultimately, since it is a one-time request, and I, I believe the thought is that we can uh, define it as a one-time request and have it come forward and then have it as a revolving fund. Well, it just seems like that it, it, it'd be one way you can use mandatory funding to circumvent the uh, regular appropriations process because you'd have to be a little think more strict about where you're going to spend the $100 million than the $3 billion. Just say, well, that came from mandatory, so, you know, I don't know where we're going to spend that. But that's something to be thinking about, too. Mr. Serrano. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
And, you know, it's amazing, Mr. Chairman, how we always land up talking about computers and IT, you know, and I, I don't know if I was being sarcastic or profound when I suggested doing the rollout of Obamacare that all they had to do was go to a college dorm and get a couple of kids who would have taken care of the problem in about 30 seconds, you know, instead of uh, doing everything else that happened. You know, one of my issues on this committee for years has been purchasing versus leasing. Uh, I think our government spends too much money leasing and at the end of the day owns nothing. Maybe there are people much smarter than me, and I'm not being sarcastic, who, who could argue that uh, leasing is much better. But has that changed at all? Because this committee made an effort to get people to say, stop leasing for so much money and purchase some of the, uh, the, 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 uh, the places that, that we need in, in our government. Pretty soon, the government will be leasing and leasing and leasing and, and, and no purchases at all. Has that changed at all? It, it, yes, sir. I will say that the committee support of consolidation funds has been a tremendous effort uh, for our, our portfolio overall. Um, we have been able to see savings uh, year over year since uh, the support of that effort, um, as well as a reduction of our footprint uh, in particular. Um, we have very much a value on the owned property. We believe the owned property is the best uh, use of the American taxpayer dollars and want to maximize our presence in the properties that are owned by the federal government. So the, the funding uh, that the committee has given us, I think over the past three years um, in particular, we had one point, um, I had it written down, actually 1.4 square feet um, of savings and a reduction in square footage, over $100 million in savings on um, lease avoidance, uh, and that's having a definite impact on the bottom line. Okay, let's, uh, <clears throat> let's move on to another area that's also of great interest to me, and it is our territories. It seems that uh, the territories always get left behind and uh, I take personal interest because I was born in one of them. And I represent the Bronx, and, uh, which has a lot of folks that were born in the territories. Does GSA make a special effort through staffing patterns and, uh, and, and programmatic patterns to make sure that the territories are being treated as fairly as the Constitution allows, which is totally fair? Because in many cases, you'll hear where they're waiting for a building for you know three or four times the amount of time that one of the states has to wait. And you wonder, you know, they're federal buildings, they're being used to service, uh, render services to American citizens, so why not the same time or something close to it? Yes, Congressman, and I know that you've had discussions, and we've had discussions um, over the recent past regarding projects in particular in Puerto Rico, um, and we have, um, we've needed to ensure, and we have, and we're in a much better place now, uh, that we have boots on the ground, so as well as hands-on efforts with any of the projects in the territories. Um, and I think that what we've seen in the turnaround of the projects in, in particular that we've discussed, um, that we can do that. And, and so it's a matter of ensuring that we are staying connected to any projects that we have in the territories um, and that we're keeping the same discipline across our portfolio uh, in terms of expectation of turnaround as well as uh, project management and schedule. Well, I would appreciate that. And, and you'd be not surprised, but you'd be happy to know that this committee does not disagree, that we want people treated equally and that sometimes because they're not a state, they don't get treated equally. Let me, let me ask you a... Uh, a question here. The omnibus bill, uh, in the omnibus bill, uh, GSA is requesting 17,000, 17% less for construction and acquisition than was provided in the fiscal year. I'm sorry, I've got it wrong. You're asking for 17% less than was provided in the omnibus for 2016. That may be understandable given that you received over a billion increase in construction in FY 2016. There have been concerns from some about your ability to handle such large increases in one year. How are you managing that many projects in the FY 2016 bill, and did they impact what you requested in 2017? 
I believe we must invest in infrastructure across the country and the territories, but I also don't want to set up, uh, to set you up for failure by not giving you the staff to manage all of your projects. Sure, and I thank you for that observation. I, I would say that, um, well, first let me start by saying that we very much appreciate uh, the committee support uh, in the FY16 budget. That has been a tremendous opportunity, um, especially in the area of courts that was mentioned earlier, earlier for us to meet uh, some of our partner needs. Um, and we are um, gearing up, we're working very closely with the courts in, in terms of evaluating their projects, uh, the timing of those projects and ensuring that we're able to move forward and execute um, on time and under budget. Um, or across the board, we have uh, a volume of needs that really exceed our resources and so what we try to ensure is that we are able to articulate to the committee where the needs are and what's driving our programming going forward um, and to ensure that we have the staffing lined up to manage what we can see coming forward um, so your support uh, has been a tremendously important and we are doing everything from our perspective to line up um, in uh, ensure that we have staffing and support in the places where that funding is um, is focused Thank you. I know we've touched on it, but how is your uh, uh, IT uh, modernization program going? The IT modernization for GSA um, overall it has been a tremendous uh, opportunity for us as an agency in, in terms of uh, really rationalizing how we're managing IT. Um, now, in, in terms of uh, having had a consolidation that we did internally, as well as establishing what we refer to as the Investment Review Board to look at uh, large level IT investments, um, really is allowing for us to support other agencies who are moving in the same direction, especially as the outgrowth of Fatara, which was um, an important effort this committee was involved with. Um, so we are um, we are seeing the dividends from that uh, consolidation activity, um, as well as being able to support other agencies as well. Thank you, and I apologize, Mr. Jim, and I was looking at my clock, and I thought it was going down, and it was actually going up. I know, it sounds like the federal budget, but I don't want to hear that comment. No comment. Mr. Yoder is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'm going to uh, not take that layup that my uh, colleague, Mr. Serrano, just gave me there, and I'm going to go back to uh, the administrator. Um, I, I note in your biography that you have a history of being sort of tech savvy, and I think you were top 50 women in tech at one point, and I actually noticed the uh, interview you did at one time where you said you uh, had an early Commodore 64, and you actually used to code your own video games. Yes. That's pretty neat. So uh, you have a, definitely a tech background, obviously you have a love of tech. And so I wanted to talk to you uh, about the real property profile. And I want to associate myself with um, the comments from my colleague, Mr. Quigley. Uh, he and I have uh, long been uh, bipartisan in our efforts to try to uh, resolve the concerns we have. And that continues to be that uh, there is uh, no there, we have had struggled to find ways to quantify the property that the federal government owns, both within the GSA and all of the property, which is a secondary issue that not all the property is with the GSA, so you've got two separate problems there. Uh, and that we really don't have the ability to tell our public you know, what we own, uh, what's vacant, what isn't vacant, um, what's idle, uh, what's owned in their community in a way that is usable. And so I was just sort of looking at the, the realpropertyprofile.gov Yes. Is that the is that the site? So I was pulling that up on my phone here, and immediately I know that it's password protected, uh, username and password, and there's really no instructions on here how someone would go about getting a, a password or a username. And, you know, when when I go through um, something like this, uh, you know, and first of all, as Mr. Quigley brought up, there's billions of dollars of property, uh, tens of thousands of pieces of property that um, the JO has said before are idle. But we would really have no way to verify that. Um, I, my checkbox would be, does it have public access? Um, is there a, a mobile app that would allow people to, you know, constituents to drive around once they have it and look at things? I don't know because it's not accessible. Is it user friendly? Um, is it comprehensive? Um, is it fully implemented in a way that people are using it today to make decisions that are informed that will allow taxpayers to save money? And so I guess, first of all, are there other standards I should be looking at, but in terms of those standards, have we met those standards, and when will we, if not? We we have been working uh, diligently to ensure we're meeting those standards with the data that we're putting forward 
for GSA in particular um, because of the dynamic nature that you refer to in terms of making it easily accessible, being able to pull it up on your mobile device. If that's not working, I, I will definitely have Well, the sites, you can pull it up, and I, it's username and password protected, and there's no description on here. It doesn't tell you. I guess you'd email Chris Canini or Stephanie Closet and ask them how to do it, but it doesn't say, it just says, have you forgot your password? Are you a GSA employee? But it doesn't say to members of the public, on this at least, mm -hmm. uh, how you do it. And I completely could be missing something you might pull up on a desktop. And, and, and that's, not, um, that's not as uh, productive as we want to be, right? We, we want people to be able to access our data in the way that they're used to with all other data in the private sector. Um, well, why is it even uh, login password protected? I mean, the whole point is to make this accessible to the public, right? Yes, absolutely. And when so does the, that happen? The idea that is password protected is surprising me as I sit here. So, okay. it, and I could be um, thinking about two different places where the data resides, which would be a challenge as well. Um, so, I will ensure that we. Yeah, this is realpropertyprofile.gov. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and we have a, uh, we, we have in particular what I'm used to seeing is a place where you can see both, especially for uh, GSA's data, the data itself, as well as, like I said, a map that is interactive. Um, the database, they, that is utilized by, or that is a representation of all of government. I don't know if that's pri password protected, but we want to make it as accessible as possible. Well, I've brought this up, I think now three years going, I brought it up to your, I think yourself last year, your predecessors, um, every year we're bringing this up on the record, um, and we're still not getting there. Uh, one thing I think that would help is if we engaged the private sector. You know, if this was a Google project, uh, you know, I think this would be, or any company out there that was trying to do a mapping project, I bet it would move swift, more swiftly. And so I guess what has GSA done to bring out the best mapping and geospatial knowledge base and expertise from the private sector to help with this? And we actually have been able to achieve uh, geospatial spatial mapping uh, with our, our data in particular. It's really the data that is the rest of the uh, federal government, which is included in the real property database, um, that we uh, that is currently not available in the same form. Anyway, just in general, has the GSA sought advice and, and worked with the, the private sector to build the best mapping system, or is it doing this internally uh, and not using private? We Oops. have consulted with private sector. I'm not sure to what extent the break happens. And we did meet with, uh, I think, even some members at, uh, at your recommendation from our last hearing. Mm -hmm. um, there was a sit down with the team there as well. So we have engaged the private sector from an expertise perspective uh, where needed and are also managing internally as well. Well, it seems like we have a long way to go. And I just know, given your tech background, that if you were on the outside of this looking in, you'd say, not acceptable. You know, the private sector would have created an app for this years ago, and we'd be able to look at every piece of property. We'd be able to compare it. Uh, policymakers would be able to utilize it. The public would. And the public could assist us by uh, finding pieces of property that were unutilized and maybe try to repurpose them, uh, saving us money. And I think whether you're a liberal or a conservative, none of us hopefully like to see idle property that could either be put to use or sold. And so it's one of those rare bipartisan things that everyone sort of wants. And I guess I'm just asking you again uh, to, to consult the private sector or do what you need to do, but to build a really solid system and an app here that people could use that would be efficient and effective. And I know that's something that you know what I'm talking about, what that would look like. We're not here with this, particularly the fact that it's not even accessible with the public. Uh, and so I just hope that if we meet in this committee again, that we'll have great news and that this will be something that, you know, the GSA can accomplish, that we can tout that, hey, government can get things done effectively and efficiently. We've got a tech-savvy leader, and she's going to make it happen. So yes, let's get it done. Yes, Congressman. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, let, me, uh, let me ask you about the federal courthouses. We, we, we appropriated, I think, $948 million to build nine new courthouses around the country, and there, there are different stages of development. Some are probably ready to go, some are in planning design. And so when we ask questions about the Hoover Building and the cost of new uh, construction, it, it raises concerns about, about what kind of handle does the agency have about like building nine new courthouses? Uh, how, how, do, how do we help you make sure that, that those monies at nine different courthouses and nine different sites, different stages of development, how can we be assured that there won't be any cost overruns or that, that those numbers are, that, that you requested, that those are pretty real numbers in terms of getting those projects done on time within the budget? 
What's been very important and will continue to be important there is working very closely with the courts uh, and especially courthouse by courthouse the requirements related to each of those projects. Um, there have been, and as you point out, Chairman, uh, some projects that have plans that are on, um, that, that, that were uh, currently pending ensuring that we're bringing those forward to see how current they are, um, ensuring that we are focused on the requirements uh, and ensuring that the requirements are really um, what's needed to meet the mission. Uh, but I think working closely with the uh, courts um, to ensure those dollars go as far as they can is uh, really a priority for us. And so your support, um, both around funding that, but as well as um, uh, keeping keeping each of the projects in alignment, uh, making sure that we get the most out of each project is very beneficial. Is there like a perspective on on each one of the courthouses? I mean, they have their each nine separate projects that you can track. There will be a spend plan coming forward in the next few weeks. Uh, I think mid-April is the timing, and that will be the outline of each of the projects, what they will entail, uh, all of those pieces. Where did you get the nine hundred forty-eight million to start with? It was based on the original estimates for the projects. Okay, so they will, we'll see these new prospectus on each one of them, and hopefully they'll match up with what the original estimates were. Yes, sir. And then you'll work to, with the judiciary and the U.S. Marshals to make sure they got the right space, the right security, and all that stuff. That's right. Let me ask, ask one last question about uh, the $35 million that we had some design money, I guess it was called a Federal Civilian Cybersecurity Campus. I know that's been talked about, and finally we put $35 million. Uh, last year, this year, there's not a request for that campus. Uh, I don't see it anywhere in the five-year plan. Uh, what, what, what happened to that $35 million? Where did it get spent, or will it be spent? And where does all that fit in long range? Um, the, the cyber project is one that we continue to work with the partner agencies to understand requirements. Um, again, I, I, I feel like I've said requirements a few times today, and I apologize, but they are a key part of us defining the scope of our projects and what will be programmed as a part of the projects, and that really has a strong impact on what's needed and necessary, as well as the timing of it. Um, so we continue to work with those partner agencies, um, and once we get a better sense of uh, what the requirements are in the programming for that activity, then we would be able to come back with a request. But those funds that you've rewarded at this point would be held for that project. So are they being used now? Where, where's that? What, what, what are you doing with that $35 million? Uh, currently, what we're doing with the project overall is working with the agencies to scope out the, the project, but, but, but I can't say. It's not in the five-year plan. I mean, there was going to be a campus, but, but so you got $35 million last year. You didn't ask for any more money this year. And I, I thought that was a planning and design money, but then if you don't need more money this year and you don't have it in your five-year plan and we're spending a lot of money on the Department of Homeland Security and an FBI building, where does this new cybersecurity campus fit in? Well, and we'll have a better sense uh, going forward where it will fit in. Um, but are you, what are you going to do with the $35 million? We would use it for planning of, of this project but first, once we receive the requirements. Where do you get the requirements? From the agencies, from the partner agencies that would be present on the cyber campus. Okay, so you're working, who, who, are, who is that? Uh, it was, it's a number of uh, agencies I would, ha I would hesitate to name, I know that I can't name them all as I'm sitting here, um, but I, I can, we can definitely follow up with the staff, but it was a number of agencies that would have a presence, and part of it is really the question of uh, what would need to be there, and, and in light, in some ways, in some respects of the pro projects that you did reference, sir, um, those would obviously have an offsetting effect, potentially, uh, for the requirements and programming of the cyber campus, but those are the pieces we're trying to figure so out. So in the planning and design, you're really not there yet? You really... That $35 million for planning and design, you're not spending that yet because you hadn't figured out exactly. We're not able to spend those dollars yet until we nail down the requirements. Okay. But it'd probably be better to have a project and then say, here's a project and here's how much we need to plan it and design it, as opposed to say, here's we need some money for planning and design on a project that we hadn't like finalized yet. Well, and I believe that it's been some uh, shifting efforts that has given us a, I believe that the project was in a different place last year, which is what brought us uh, forward with the request. Um, but as we get a better sense of the requirements, then we would be in a position to go forward. 
Mr. Uh, Serrano, any more questions? Just one more, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <clears throat> after last year's massive breach at the Office of Personnel Management and the Department of Interior, there is rightfully more scrutiny regarding government's ability to keep information safe. Efforts are still on the way to strengthen those systems, including in GSA's own budget request to start a new IT fund. I have some concern that in GSA's budget, you want five million for 20 FTE to establish a unified shared services management office that will promote consolidation of government systems and information. Shouldn't we ensure these systems have the highest level of security before we further consolidate government? Government efficiency is a goal, but so is security and information. Yes, sir. Uh, the um, and I appreciate the observation. Security with our systems is very key, and the shared services office um, was stood up to support both existing shared services uh, offices that are providing shared services, as well as those who may be seeking to go to shared services. Um, so this team, in particular, is really supporting. Uh, it, as we look to go to shared services, all the requirements of any system is being met, including security requirements. And obviously, as we've learned over the past uh, year, we continue to enhance from our learning. Um, the security parameters will and are changing on sy systems as well, and that would be integrated in terms of the information that this office would share with anyone seeking to go into shared services systems. Now, that refers to your office, uh, to GSA, being able to be involved with other agencies yes. in the sharing. Do you think, as it stands now, you might have to hold back and, and uh, wait for a while before we go further, or do you think you're ready to go with, with uh, consolidating? The, um, and just to be clear, we're, GSA would not actually be the ones consolidating any okay. of these systems or the services. We are, our team would help with the analysis and evaluations and recommendations of which shared service provider to meet the need of any particular agency. Um, so we're looking at there, and, and GSA has provided shared services in the past, as you know, such as our um, financial management services, um, which we've divested from, as well as our HR uh, services. Um, but this office in particular is looking at services, shared services across federal government um, and making either recommendations for agencies who are looking to go to a shared service or if there are shared service providers who are looking to upgrade or um, divest from their efforts supporting those efforts. What we have found is that our shared services has been a place for uh, savings for agencies, uh, but having the uh, support come from a central place would be beneficial for everyone. Well, I have no further questions, Mr. Chairman. I just want to thank you for your service to our country and for the difficult issues you deal with on a daily basis. Well, th thank you, thank Congressman, you. for your support. And I'm not thanking you for the day for having problems every day. I'm no. thanking you for for dealing with them. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Do you have any closing comments? I rest my case. You rest this case. Well, let me close by thanking you as well, um, and in particular, thank you, Administrator, and your staff. Uh, for personally getting involved uh, in a project down in Jacksonville, Florida, which was a, a Coast Guard Customs and Border Patrol project. Uh, it was been going on since 2007. Uh, there were lots and lots of problems, uh, but I'm told that within the next couple of weeks, the building's going to open, the Coast Guard will move in, the Border Patrol folks will move in. Uh, I got involved in, in 2013. So I'm just as excited as you are to see this project come to fruition. So uh, you're certainly welcome to come down to sunny Florida and, and, and view the new project. Uh, I plan on looking at it myself, first chance I get. But again, thank you for your commitment to making that happen. And again, thank you for being here today when this hearing is adjourned. Thank you.